Welcome to the On Purpose Investor Podcast show number 63, our interview with Tony Castillo. Tony Castillo is an elite nutrition expert specializing in sports nutrition and aiding athletes, business leaders, and anyone seeking to boost their performance through nutrition. Tony's background has led him to work with Major League Baseball teams such as the Toronto Blue Jays and the University of Florida. Tony's journey started in middle school as an overweight student and continued into high school until he jumped onto a diet resulting in unsustainable weight loss. Today, Tony is on a mission to teach others about the significance of a healthy lifestyle modifications that can optimize performance in every area of life. Welcome to the On Purpose Investor Podcast. My name is Eric Vogel. I'm a real estate investor, mastermind coach, husband to an amazing woman, and often my co-host, Tiffany, and father to two incredible boys. I'm on a mission to help you become a real estate investor and not only achieve seven-figure success like my wife and I did, but to do so with intention, direction, and clarity. If you want to transform your financial and personal goals, become the version of yourself you've always wanted, and reach your dream life ASAP, then you're in the right place. Thank you for deciding to hit that play button today. Now let's begin. Welcome to the podcast, Tony. We're super excited to have you here today. Welcome. <laughs> Eric, I wish I had a rap horn. The bah, 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 bah. <laughs> Just, uh, That's like an intro because I see you got the guitars in the background. You like some music. I'm feeling the vibes. We got our Hawaiian shirts on. We are ready Man. to roll, Eric. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm excited for this episode. Absolutely, Tony. And I think it's only just and right for me to tell our listeners and those watching on YouTube that when we first met about 10 minutes ago, Tony did not have a very fun shirt on. I did and not. I, I came on and I usually don't wear fun shirts either. He's like, oh my God, Eric, I know we just met, but I've got to change. <laughs> <laughs> and he came back with the most prolific Hawaiian shirt out there. It's lobsters. My two and a half year old would be losing his mind trying to get those lobsters off yeah. of your shirt. <laughs> oh, I, if my two and a half year old, I, I have one with sharks on it because she loves baby shark. So that one she always loves. So I got to test out the lobster one. It's been a while since I, I rocked this one. So I have to see what she feels about it. <laughs> well, I've got to go back into Amazon and and boost up my Hawaiian shirt because I have I have some toucans. Ooh. I have this one and I've got some like other ones that are just floral. The traditional real estate investor Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I like the toucan one. I have to look that one up, Eric. Oh, it's a good one. It's a good yeah. one. Maybe next time if we have you on again, I'll wear the toucans. We might have to match. Dad's so, doing Hawaiian shirts. <laughs> That's right. If not, if you don't take anything else out of this episode today, just know toucan shirts, Hawaiian shirts, lobster shirts, it makes you a happier person. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and happiness breeds, you happiness. know, happiness breeds happiness. And also it just breeds success because right. when you're happy, you'll do better at what you're doing. <laughs> Absolutely, Eric. I agree. So with I'm not going to lie, Tony. I was reading your introduction and I could not figure out how to say dietetics or diet. You said it absolutely right. Dietetics. dietetics. I heard you in the back. And as soon as I said, I was like, dietetics. And you had it. I was like, you crushed it. <laughs> oh, man. I, I'm going to have to go fix that because I don't know. I've never said that word a day in my life. Uh, maybe that'll be my first question for you. What is dietetics? Oh, I'm so happy you asked that. And this is something I don't get to answer very often. So we hear a lot about nutritionists. Well, at least in the state I'm in, which is Florida, my mom has a dog. It is a Yorkie. And you're probably like, why is he even talking about a dog? But I could sign up my mom's Yorkie named Bella, and she could be a nutritionist. I know dietitians that have actually done this to prove the fact that literally anyone can be a nutritionist. Not everyone can be a dietitian. So a dietitian, you have to go to school and at least get a bachelor's degree in a science background. And now... And 2024, it's actually going to be boosted that you at least need a master's degree. And after that, you need at least 1,200 hours of internship because we want to make sure that the dietitians that are serving our communities all around the world, they at least have some science background because there's a lot of science behind nutrition. And we'll be going into my story in a little bit, but I used to think when you worked at a gym, you automatically knew nutrition knowledge. We always hear personal trainers throwing things down, even give, giving out meal plans, which is actually illegal for anyone that doesn't have a dietetics degree to give. Um, but people still do it, Eric. And I myself know so much about working out and lifting weights. I still don't give out workout plans because I, I'm not an expert in it. I didn't go to school for it. And if someone does a movement incorrectly, they can get injured. And I don't want to put that on myself. I'd rather them get the best help possible. So I stay in my lane 
which is being a dietitian, because I went, I got my master's in nutrition. I did my due diligence in my hours at an internship working at a hospital. So when I serve people one-on-one, I have that knowledge behind me to really help them not just look better and feel better from the outside, but from the inside. I'm glad you answered that. Now I know how to say it and what it is. (laughs) Dietetics. Dietetics. You got it. Dietetics. Got it. So people on our podcast often come to our show to learn about, you know, tips and tricks of the trade for real estate investing. And we've been really moving in a direction of trying to get people to live their life a little more purposefully. And in order to live your life a little more purposefully, we go through a lot of things on building a roadmap to know where you're headed, making sure that all the things that we truly want out of life are in alignment with the decisions that we make today. And one of the big things that I see tons of very successful, you know, CEOs of companies, celebrities, uh, athletes. One of the biggest things that they place emphasis on is their internal health. A lot of them are into like the, you know, making sure they eat you know, a spoonful of brown sugar or, or, or cinnamon, not brown sugar, <laughs> yeah. but, or, or they eat, you know, turmeric or, you know, they, they cleanse or they go on fasts and they do all this other stuff. But, you know, it seems no matter what they do, they really have a focus on making sure that their body is healthy and fueled so that they can reach these aspirations. And so if you're listening to the show and you're like, this is not real estate investing, <laughs> I know it's not. This, this episode is brought to you to help you understand a little bit more about why it's so important to be genuinely healthy and why fueling your body with the things that you really need are super important and how that's going to catapult you to a life of full intention and that you actually get to achieve that life and not achieve it in a wheelchair or on some type of assistance or full of all of these you know, pharmaceutical drugs. We want to get you there and we want you to be there and be able to climb those mountains you're trying to climb or to go on those cruises that you want to go on or walk those sandy beaches in these, you know, amazing islands that you want to do. And that's why when Tony uh, and his team reached out and said, do we fit? I was like, oh, my gosh, yes, you fit. And it was like this aligns the the stars have aligned because this is what we need in our community. You know, enough with the. How do I master lease? How do I structure a subject to deal? How do I talk to sellers? We've done a lot of that. Now it's time to take a step forward into how can I be a truly, genuinely healthy person with my lifestyle? So Tony, I said a little bit about your background. Give me your spiel of it. Give me your story. I want to hear it. Absolutely. And I want to say this is totally in line with real estate investing because we're going to talk about something that can help people that are actually investing in real estate have 10% better performance. So what do I mean by that? Like they can actually focus on a deal and close the deal and do it well because they are more in tune with their body and they know exactly what's going on. And anyone that can be 10% better, I'm sure they're going to make that decision a little bit wiser. So we will be talking about some actionable tips today that will help people not only invest in real estate, but invest in themselves and be better selves at the end of the day and make better deals. Uh, Because I know nothing about subject two. (laughs) (laughs) If you ask me, Eric, I'm going to have to say, uh, we're going to have to take a hard pass. I don't take the fifth because I just don't know about it. I literally say, I don't know. (laughs) There you go. And that's fine. But you do know about healthy lifestyle. That's right. So my own journey. So again, Eric, thank you so much for having me on. Thank you for bringing the Hawaiian on today. I'm really excited to be here. So my own journey, as you mentioned a little bit, when I was younger about, uh, so my parents got divorced at a very young age. I was between eight to 10 years old. And at 13 years old, I was going through depression. Both my parents are diagnosed with depression. My mom's diagnosed as bipolar. And when my parents split, my dad moved back to Dominican Republic, where he's from. My mom stayed with me and my sister here in the States, and my sister had Down syndrome. She's two years older than me, so it was really just me, my mom, and my sister. And I had to do a lot. I had to step up and, quote, unquote, be the man of the house to help my mom out with my sister because she had a lot of things she couldn't do. So I was finding ways to use food to take that emotional gap I had. So emotional eating, stress eating. And my mom was someone who we can now call as an almond mom. So an almond mom is someone that just takes any diet fad and pushes it on everyone. I just found out this word the other day. I had no clue until recently. So my mom would do Jenny Craig, Weight Watchers, low carb, low fat, just anything that would pop up at the time. And one of the things I remember, there's those big canisters of cheese balls. I used to take that and I'd have that in my room because my mom says we couldn't have it out. And I'd have to eat it alone in my room so that no one would see me and so she wouldn't see it. So that's where Mm -hmm. my food challenge started 
And then I had something called body dysmorphia where I didn't feel at home in my body. Well, at 13 years old, uh, depression hit. I was overweight. I was uh, around 250 pounds at 13 years old. And I went to go see a urologist for my mother and they did blood work. Everything came back normal. And what they saw, Eric, was that I had something called gynecomastia, which if we break it down, that's man boobs. That's all it really is. Mm -hmm. And it's because I was overweight. It was the food I was putting in my body. I just wasn't happy. And it really did have an effect on my mental status as well. So not only how I outwardly look, but inwardly as well. Well, all throughout middle school and high school, I was yo-yoing. I didn't really, you know, hit in puberty, didn't know what was going on. And that urologist said I had two options at 13 years old, Eric. It was either testosterone replacement therapy or plastic surgery. I took neither of those options, which is crazy. At 13 years old, what? How is this the only options that I was given over 20 years ago? And if now I can't even imagine what they're offering, if it's not talking to a professional to talk about what's going on, Eric, right? We go down a whole rabbit hole there, but uh, to keep keep it back in the nutrition space. So uh, I was an offensive lineman in football. So the really big guys, I played football. I was also in the band because I was just overweight. I didn't know what I, I wasn't very athletic. And it wasn't until the end of high school, my senior year, where a friend of mine gave me a bodybuilding meal plan and a bodybuilding uh, workout plan. And I lost the weight. Eric, I felt great. I had confidence. I actually mm. stared at myself in the mirror because at that time, uh, a lot of the, the buff guys were moving their boobs. <laughs> and, friend, and that's what they could do, move their pecs, right? Just move them up and down, and show their muscles. I'd stare in the mirror until one day it finally moved. And I was like, finally, I could conquer the one thing people would make fun of me about. Well, mm. I went to college, Eric, and all that went out the window. Uh, I decided that pizza, beer, and tacos tasted way better than any meal plan I was on. So I gained all the weight back. I got up to 252. I remember looking down at the scale. It was 252, 253, and I was like, what am I doing? So I tried every diet at the time, and I tried to find that meal plan again. It was a lot of Atkins, a lot of South Beach diet. I even tried fat burners. I tried every kind of supplement that was out there to figure out what was going on, Mm. and none of it worked. So I finished my degrees in college with biology and chemistry. I took a year off, and it was a Halloween night. I went dancing, and I broke my foot dancing because I was eating 1,500 calories a day and doing two workouts a day. And it, I was under fueling or not giving myself enough calories. And I just wasn't mm. happy. I was preoccupied with the way I look. I was isolating myself because I wouldn't go out with my friends to eat because I didn't want to eat chicken wings because I thought it was going to make me fat. I wouldn't eat pizza with them. I'd bring meals with me. I was really isolating versus enjoying the moment and being with my friends and not worried so much because my friends loved me for who I was. They didn't care mm. what my body looked like. Right. I was the, the guy over summer when I'd go out with them to the beach, I'd wear a shirt because I didn't want people to see what was under there because I was just so scared and I I thought people would judge me from that. Well, after I broke my leg, the first thought that went through my head, Eric, was how am I going to work out? And I knew right in that moment that something wasn't right. Something wasn't right. I went to an open house with my wife and they had a degree in nutrition. And as as we were just talking about moments ago, I thought you could get it, just work at a gym and you got a degree in nutrition. So I sat Mm -hmm. for my first nutrition class, Eric, and I loved it. I knew that's exactly where I wanted to be educating people on how what they eat fuels them for what they do. Mm -hmm. Well, I did my internship, as mentioned earlier, and I worked at a hospital. And there was a gentleman who just had open heart surgery, Eric. And I come in and I walk in and the gentleman says, are you the food guy? And I say, yeah, I guess you could call me that. I am the food guy. All right, great. And he's like, can you get me freaking mac and cheese and freaking fried chicken? And I said, excuse me? He's like, yeah, can you get me those two things? And I look at him. He literally just had our open heart surgery. He had a tube coming out of his throat or throat out of his chest with fluids draining out of it because he just had surgery. I was like, sure, you just had open heart surgery. I'm here to talk to you about your diet because the choices you're making are putting you in here. And he's like, well, I have a new heart. So who cares what I eat? Can you get me the freaking fried chicken or the mac and cheese? And in that moment, Eric, I knew that's not where I wanted to be at. Mm. I knew that's not the person I wanted to help move forward, right? A lot of people are going for what is the Band-Aid, not what is the root cause of the solution. So from there, I went to go work at the University of Florida, as you mentioned earlier, with their athletes. Why? Because I want to know how come these athletes are performing at peak performance, look the way they do, and eat foods that I never thought we should eat, such as carbs, such as dairy products. These things that we hear today, we should stay away from, but they're promoting them. So what's the secret behind it? I was like, are they are they doing some sort of steroids in the background? Are they doing some sort of supplement that I'm not aware of? Mm-hmm. It was none of that, Eric. I had a great relationship with food, and they used food to fuel their body for what they were doing. Right. And then I went to go work because some of these some of these young athletes were in the Olympics. And I was like, whoa, this is awesome. What are they taking? What are they eating? And again, it was literally using food as their fuel source. 
Mm. And then when I went to go work in professional baseball, it was taking it to that next level of people being Hall of Famers, trying to make it in their careers. And it was a dream that so many people wanted to achieve. And as you, you speak so much on, I wasn't happy because I was working countless hours and I wasn't able to really fuel my own self with purpose from food wise. I was able to fuel these athletes to be their best. But again, I started to go down that weight gain track again because I just wasn't happy where I was and I was using that food as a crutch. Well, right. Eventually, I started my own business, my own practice, which I've been doing now for close to five years. And I've been educating so many entrepreneurs, small business owners to eat and to train like athletes. When I say train, I don't give them the training plans, but I tell them how to fuel what they're doing. So people who are mm-hmm. investing in themselves, right, just like these athletes want to perform at their best, yeah. how much brain fog can someone that's listening to the show eliminate? How much less stress can they do or have based on what they're eating or how much sleep they're getting? So that led me to where I am today because I had those same struggles. I was stressed out. I had the extra uh, freshman 15, quote unquote, but when we're starting a business, I think that should be another freshman 15 that we're adding on because we tend to put our wealth for our health. And then when we finally get to the health, we don't have the happiness that we've always wanted to achieve because we put so many other things as priorities versus actually taking into account what our bodies are actually doing and taking Mm -hmm. on. Yeah, I love the phrase they're putting their wealth before their health. And the the problem in placing your money and your value, your literally the currency in your pocket versus the currency within your soul. And when you do that, you're living like, you know, a 500 pound person where all your weight's on your shoulders and you have nothing supporting the, the bottom of it and you just tip over. And when people place the emphasis on the things they can have and buy and do before, can I enjoy the things that I wanna buy and have and do? You're living out of alignment. I love that you're talking about these professional Olympians, these these professional sports players, how they're fueling their body with things that you and I have both been told probably much our whole lives don't do it. I mean, I I remember uh, about seven eight years ago I weighed two twenty five and I'm only five foot nine, and so I carried it. I was I was a hefty fella, and. I just like, I got to lose this weight because I'm in the national guard. And I was like, I got to, I got to pass this PT test and I got to do all this stuff. I was like, well, I I guess the only thing I know how to shed 30 pounds in in two months is to do keto. And so I went, I went full on keto two Mm -hmm. months straight and boy, did I lose it. I lost it all. And I passed that PT test and I did all the great things. And then six months later I had it back. And you know, I'd often battled weight loss uh, similar to you. And I was in the band as well. I actually am a retired high school band director. No so way. I, yeah. That's what I used to do before what? I became a real estate investor. Yeah. So I was the, I was the fat tuba kid. <laughs> <laughs> I was marching around with the sousaphone and, and no, I was the the sousaphone. you're for real. You know it. Cause not a lot of people call the sousaphone. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So oh. I was, I was the fat kid and yeah. I grew up in a fairly turbulent home as well. And I know that I lean on the the homemade biscuits and the gravy oh. and the fried chicken and fried pork chops and you know when we had vegetables they were covered in butter and oh yeah sugar. so i mean it was like yeah we ate green things but usually there was Velveeta cheese on all the broccoli yeah, or just, fried okra one or yeah, the other a lot of cheese okra. and butter or fried okra Ooh, like every time <laughs> that's it so i i do you know i really feel like i get where where you came from and it, it wasn't until recently that I have just really found some solace in how I feel my body. Uh, my wife and I, she did Noom not too long ago, the, the, the art and science of connecting, you know, your emotional pathways with how you eat and the neuroscience behind eating. And it was very helpful for her. I had also went down a similar path of just counting calories, but then getting into the macro counting and like, do I have enough fiber today? Do I have enough you know, iron and is riboflavin. What What is going on with all this? And I learned a little bit about it and I don't know a ton, but I do know enough to know when I feel satisfied and when to stop. And I, I want to hear a little bit more about how are you guiding people into a path of making sure they're fueling their body without inundating them with all of the the data? Because you could be, unless you're a data person and you love all the data, when you go into one of those macro counters, you can be inundated and just overwhelmed and say, I'm just going to grab the bag of Doritos and, <laughs> and I'll, that's try it. It again. I'll try it again tomorrow. 
Absolutely. Um, and that was me. I was like, <laughs> I don't know. I have like 20% here, 8% here, but I should only be at six and a half percent. I, I, I'm done. Yep. <laughs> I would just check out. Yeah. So how are you guiding your students into a path of success? Well, Eric, I want to comment on a few things, man. Love that you're a former band director. I used to play trumpet. Yeah. But with the ketogenic diet, I'm glad that you did it for a short amount of time. And I state that because Personally, I know that the ketogenic diet was created for medical nutrition therapy reasons. So for, for, for people who had epilepsy or seizure, it's actually been shown to help them have less seizures. So it is a medical nutrition therapy that has been used and continues to be used in people that have brain challenges. Now, the one thing I will say, many people, and I don't know what your case was, so I'm, I'm not calling you out here, so don't take it that way. It's more people do keto wrong. And here's mm -hmm. the main reason people do keto wrong. They do very high protein. They don't do high fat. When it comes to the ketogenic diet, protein actually needs to be moderate. Why? There's something that it's called gluconeogenesis. I'm not going to throw a lot of science at you today, but bear with me here, Eric. So <laughs> gluco means carb, neo means new, genesis means creation of, the creation of a new carb. So what happens is when our body has a lot of protein, it actually converts or changes that protein into a carb. So we waste our time being afraid of carbs when our body knows that it's essential fuel source or what it needs to actually have energy is yeah. carbs. So it will take protein and make it into a carb. So when someone does keto, which I have no problem with, I have many people I work with that came to me after doing keto and finding that lack of sustainability. Mm -hmm. And that's what I teach. It's about sustainability. How can we make this work for you? So as you mentioned, that bag of Cheetos, I'm working with someone right now. He is a C-sweeter, him and his wife. I'm actually working with both of them. They're both uh, C-sweeters. They have two daughters. And the, the gentleman, he loves his daughter's Cheez-Its. Even if they're pre-portioned and they're a little 100-calorie pack, he'll still go grab a couple in the afternoon, at least before we started working together. He didn't have a lot of energy. He had that you know donut, as we like to call it, the, the tire around the stomach. And he didn't have a routine about working out or even sleep. Well, I never took away the Cheez-Its because if we take away foods, Eric, that we want them more. Right. I can say that from personal experience and from so many people I've worked with. When we take away foods, we always want more. Every time we restrict something, we want more of it. Think about it when we tell our kids, don't do that. They're going to go ahead and do it. So we have to find other ways to educate. So with my clients, we do what's called plate building. So, yes, you can absolutely use data, which you can use macro tracking. I send my clients a scale so we can measure body fat and muscle mass. Some clients, I even send something called a whoop, which is a heart rate monitor so we can monitor their sleep and how much physical activity or strain they're actually doing. That way I can get some biofeedback from them without them having to do anything. But when we look at the food that they're intaking, I do the plate method. So to go to that client that has the Cheez-Its, what I want them to do is have a palm of protein at mealtime. So the same size as your palm, not counting your fingertips, the same width at, at one meal, and then two fists of fruits or vegetables, and then one fist of carbohydrates. Now that carbohydrate can come in any way, shape, or form. He chose the Cheez-Its. And guess what? He was still full. He's able to live his life. And he's already seen some stomach fat go down, which is something he was trying to achieve. He's having more energy with his kids. And his wife is getting similar results. So I teach what's called plate building because that's how we can make it sustainable. Because yes, I do agree macro tracking or calorie counting can be a helpful tool. But how do you track something when you go out to eat? That's one of the biggest things I hear, right? Whether you're going to go eat sushi or you're going to go eat uh, at a restaurant, how much oil, how much butter. Now we're guesstimating and then people get into the weeds and they get inundated with so much data versus yeah. that. Let's just look at a plate. How can we make this sustainable so you can live a long life and you're not stressed out about nutrition? And this was the same thing I was working on with the athletes I was working with, people that have won World Series, people that have won gold medals. And I teach it to people now because it's so easy and so practical. And it's about the sustainability of it because I want people, I want whoever I work with to take the things that they learn and make it work in the long term. This isn't just a short-term fix because short-term fix do not give us anything we want. Even though the magic bullet is not out yet, the silver bullet isn't out, people keep jumping on in new fads, it's about what you can be consistent with. That's the secret sauce. What can you be consistent with? So if I'm able to educate or we're able to educate what people eat and what it looks like, that's how they make the biggest wins and the biggest strides. Yeah, I love you talking about the the plates and stuff yeah. and that you know people's hands are pretty much, unless you're you know, built with massive hands or baby <laughs> hands. Um, you know, there's some jokes there that we could play on. But, <laughs> but, you know, if your your hands are in proportion to the size of your body, 
you know, that, that handful of protein, I usually include the fingertips and probably put both hands together. Like that's the size steak I want to eat right there. But you know, when you're putting it in that shape, I mean, that's probably what a five, six ounce steak for me. Exactly. And, and it's not a huge thick steak when I really want the porterhouse, this 20 something ounces and I want to eat all, we the all do. fat around it. And, but you know, when, instead of eating that giant piece of steak and a sweet potato and all the rolls, you know, instead get that six ounce steak and then get a yeah. bunch of broccoli in this hand. And then, you know, like you said, a fruit or another vegetable in this hand and then eat that roll because that roll is about the size of your fist. You know, exactly. don't, like you said, don't, don't remove it. When I go to Texas Roadhouse, I oh, want yeah. that cinnamon butter and I want, well, the cinnamon honey butter with that mm. giant roll. We all do. <laughs> if, if I don't, if I don't eat it, I'm like, did I really go to Texas Roadhouse? I don't know because <laughs> I didn't and satisfy that urge. Eric, you just built the plate. That's the beauty of it. You just implemented what I just taught in a few seconds in just a <laughs> minute. And I love that, Eric, because that's the whole point of this. How can we take action steps home? How could someone who's listening build this? And I tell people, I'm more than happy to share what's behind the curtains. I have nothing to hide because I want people to learn. I want everyone to live a long and healthy life. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad you literally just brought that up because the client I was just mentioning, I had a call with him earlier this morning. And one thing I teach is about protein timing because so many of us want that big porterhouse steak. Mm -hmm. And what was shown in a study where they had two groups of NFL drafts, and I'm not saying that we're not NFL drafters, but I'm not saying we all are NFL drafters. But what they did is they gave them the same exact diet, except they did one thing different. So they had the same exact training plan, and they had the same amount of protein, carbs, and fats. What they changed, though, Eric, was the amount of time they had and how much they had at each meal. So what do I mean? So the standard American diet is something such as an egg for breakfast, so one egg, very low protein. For lunch, maybe a chicken breast, a little bit higher. And then eventually for dinner, they have the porterhouse. Now, they did this study for 16 weeks. And the other group had 30 grams of protein every three to four hours. And what they found is that if you eat that equal amount of protein throughout the day, every three mm -hmm. to four hours, there was almost like a light switch that was turned on and it built muscle. Yeah. Now, the group that had the small egg and the chicken breast, and it wasn't until they had the porterhouse at night was the light switch turned on because they weren't eating enough. They didn't have that palm size of protein. And what they saw is that after 16 weeks, Eric, they actually gained up to 10% more muscle mass and they dropped 2% body fat. So just by eating their protein, the same amount of protein, but it was how they distribute it throughout the day where they're not backloading it. So I love that you brought that up because so many of us want to go for that <clears throat> porterhouse, but we're avoiding having it throughout the day. And mm -hmm. it's something just such, such a small change that can make such a big impact on our muscle and our body fat and even our hunger cues that we're talking about. So I didn't mean to interrupt you, but it's just like no. I wanted to bring it all back because it's just like you, you threw that up without even knowing it was something that I was going to bring up. So I appreciate you bringing that up, Eric. Yeah, absolutely. So I read in, in your bio, you like to talk about body dysmorphia. And one thing that, that I see a lot in students of mine in the real estate space is they don't necessarily have body dysmorphia. They kind of have a vision dysmorphia. You know, they see Ooh. people that are successful and they have this imposter syndrome of, I do want to be successful like that, but that's not who I am. And they have like this whole life dysmorphia. And I, I want you to talk a little bit about male body dysmorphia, its impact on mental health. And I think that in getting into this, it could really help both our male and female listeners out there on relating like what is dysmorphia and what impacts is it having on our mental health? And how can we also overcome this dysmorphia of what success in our lives looks like? Eric, I love that you brought that up because the first question that came to my head when you said that about vision dysmorphia is, do your goals match your behaviors? Mm. Do your behaviors match your goals? Because so many times we have this vision, but we're not doing what needs to be done, whether it's with real estate investing, whether it's the way we want to look, whether it's the foods that we want to eat are we matching what we're trying to do? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we're staying in our own way. So right. body dysmorphia is that you have a, a almost self-absorption. I don't want to call it narcissism because it's not narcissism, but you might look at yourself in the mirror every time you're walking by it and you're just not happy or pleased. And it causes that isolation that I was mentioning earlier where I'd bring uh, a microwavable meal to a wing house because I didn't want to eat the wings because I was worried about what I was going to eat. Mm -hmm. I would distance myself from my friends when they were having any of these activities, because I didn't want them to not only not see me eat, but I didn't want to be tempted with the foods they were having. And then when it was Sunday, I do my cheat meal, 
have I remember my biggest cheat meal I ever had was a whole pizza, a whole burrito from a, a Chipotle and burgers and fries. I had never felt, to be honest with you, Eric, so bad because I was just so full. And again, it's one of those things that I did because I thought that's what I had to do to lose the weight. I mm-hmm. thought that you had to do a cheat meal. And having that body dysmorphia, think about not only how my gut felt, but my mental space as well. And I wasn't feeding it the foods it needed. And one thing you mentioned earlier was fiber. So we know that fiber helps that gut health or that gut microbiota and that mind. All the things I was doing before I learned about nutrition was affecting my mental health, not only because I wasn't happy with what I was seeing in the mirror and I was Mm -hmm. comparing myself to others. And there's people who dedicate their lives to looking a certain way. I want to dedicate my life to empowering those to feel and perform the way they want to feel. Not Mm -hmm. only look the way because that's part of it, but aesthetics and performance are two different things. And I like to bring that up so much. So I like to perform at my best. And sometimes that's not a six pack abs. And I'll be honest with you, Eric, it's about having a little bit of fluff because you need that cushion to help with some of the movements I do, Mm -hmm. right? You want to be able to run around with your kids. And if my, if my daughter wants to go out for ice cream, I'm going to go have the freaking ice cream, Mm -hmm. right? I need that to fit into my lifestyle because I want memories to be made, not macros. And that's the big thing here. Because we think about how much we do waste away because we have this ideal that we're trying to achieve. But do our goals match our behaviors? Is our long term matching that? Right? Because in the long term, I want to be the father. I want to be the husband. I want to be the provider that my family looks back on and doesn't say, Mm -hmm. oh man, my dad used to go to, I mean, Pizza Huts don't really exist anymore, but I remember going to Pizza Hut having the book club, but going to Pizza (laughs) Hut and and, and bringing a boxed meal, like that's not it. Right? I want to have pizza with my kids because it's just, food. I don't want them to think of it good and bad. So that body dysmorphia is just having a overarching, just self-absorbing lifestyle because you're trying to compare yourself to others. And the only person you compare, compare yourself is to yourself. And some people are in chapter one, some people are in chapter 20. And all you can do is compare yourself to how you were the day before and how you can move the needle forward. And things people can do to, to, to really help out one, talk to a mental health provider. That's a really big help. I, I won't deny that at all. Two, what are you doing to actually make changes? Because so many of us try to do it on our own. Just like you said, you have students, people who want to learn. It's reaching out and asking for help. Because Eric, I know nothing about subject two, as I mentioned earlier. But if that's something I want to learn, I'd reach out to you because it makes sense. I'm not going to do it on my own because now I'm going to spend the next however many years it took for you to learn where I could cut that time in half. I can cut that time so much shorter and just learn from you and just get it done and set up my life the way I want it to. Yeah. Right. Those are the things I'd really reach out to is really trying to understand mm-hmm. where is it coming from? Who are people you can reach out to to help you get over that hurdle? Right. Uh, there's this motto that I cling on to and my wife loves to remind me to cling on to it. Uh, it's the be, do, have mentality, especially when it comes to having imposter syndrome. You want to be them. And so you essentially you're going to have to start doing the things that they do. And then eventually you will have it. And the idea of this dysmorphia in the sense of, you know, having vision dysmorphia or life dysmorphia until, like you said, you start to be the kind of person that aligns with that life. And then you start doing the things that gets you to that point, then you will have those results. And when you're talking about, you know, making a shortcut, if you want to know about real estate investing or, you know, private equity, or you want to learn about, you know, the subject to, or any of that stuff, You know, you could go learn it. I mean, YouTube is full of free education out there, but it's going to take you like it took me three and a half, four years of constant consumption. And then all of the deals that I've went out and done and having all that hands on experience, you can shortcut that by coming to me. Just like with you, you can shortcut, you know, trying to figure out all the macros and stuff. You could you could shortcut all of that by going to the coach. There's a great book out there called Who Not How. And it's the idea of creating these shortcuts in your life. Stop trying to figure out how to do things unless it's the one thing that brings you the most joy in your life, right? Find who can do it for you, right? And so I'm not the best at podcast editing. I can do it. I did have to figure it out on the first like dozen, two dozen episodes. <laughs> because I just, I, I needed to know how it worked. And, you know, yeah. I didn't have the mentality of, well, you could hire a VA to go do that. Yeah. Right. So I had to go do that. <laughs> yeah. So I had to read that book, Who Not How. I think it's uh, Ben Hardy. I, I think that's mm-hmm. who wrote that book. That mentality of create those shortcuts in your life so that you are able, able to focus on the one thing that's most important to you. 
And the one thing is also an awesome book that I love as well. <laughs> that one's another great book. So Tony, I, I love that you're talking about these ways to fuel your body to get you to that next stage of your life so that you can have sustained energy. So you can have a sustained life and not trying to build a life that is that may look very glamorous on Instagram or Facebook, uh, you know, the beach bod and the, you know, chiseled abs or the, you know, sculpted back, all that. It may look good. I mean, it looks, you know, it looks great in the movies. It looks, it's what we expect to see, you know, it's what we expect out of the rock. It's what we expect out of Arnold Schwarzenegger back in the day. It's what we expect to see, but in our lives, we would not have the space for our family. We would not have the space for, creating moments and memories. We would not have the space for, for any of that in our personal lives unless you put more emphasis on the, the exercise and the nutrition than you do your family and your, and your memory making. Now, there are definitely families out there that align their whole family with this type of lifestyle and the whole family Absolutely. looks like this and that's their one thing and that's, that's what they want to do. And, you know, exactly. by all means, do it and chase that for the majority of us. There's no reason we can't be healthy and be there for our families and create those lasting memories and, and be very healthy in the moment and have the things you want to have, you know, have your cake, eat it too, and, <laughs> and live to be you know, yep. 80 or 90 and see your grandkids, see your great grandkids and create those memories. You know, the last thing you want to do is be on your deathbed and wish you hadn't eaten Whataburger every other day <laughs> in your 30s and 40s. You know, yeah, that's the right. last thing you want to do is like, you yep. know, sitting on your deathbed in your 60s because you had Whataburger every other day in your 30s and 40s because, you know, I was that's just what I like to eat. And, you know, you weren't thinking about, well, what is it going to be like when I'm 60? You know, I have, you know, this these arteries that are clogged up like the Hoover Dam and water's not going to pass. My blood's not going to circulate because of all this junk I fueled my body with. In my sense, I had to wake up about five, six years ago when I met my wife and we wanted to have a family. And I said, I want to be able to play baseball with my kids when I'm 40 and 50. I want to be able to run on the track with my kids in my 40s and 50s. I can't do that with the life that I'm living right now. I am sedentary. I am fueling my body with bugles and, you know, hot dogs. And I am drinking way more alcohol than I ever should. Yep. And those things are not fueling me to live this long, sustainable life. So the idea that, that you're sharing with our listeners and me today is that I love, I'm going to call it the hand, you know, <laughs> the, the build a plate method. Yep. And I'm, I'm going to start doing that today. And I'm going to run my lunch by you. I just had a, a Oh, lunch. I'm excited. Let's I just had it. a lunch. I had, so I had two pieces of bread, right? It was the, Perfect. I make my own bread though. So I use, Ooh. yeah, I, I don't mill my, um, my wheat oats yet, but I will, but it's just whole wheat and some bread flour and that's it. I mean, just, that's great. There's an egg and there's a little honey in there, but I make mm. my own bread. I make it about every four days because it goes bad pretty quick. Cause it's not mm. full of pre preservatives. Right. Mm. So I had two slices of bread. I had carved Turkey, a slice of American cheese. That's the bad one because yeah, it's not actually <laughs> cheese, but it's, it's what makes the sandwich a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> and I had some pickles and then I had a small, tiny bag of salt and vinegar chips that were kettle cooked. Ooh. So. <laughs> oh, well, we can break that down into what kind of plate that is, right? Because yeah. so we have three plates. We have lean, maintain, and then gain, depending on where people are on their journey. So if someone's trying to lose weight or lean out, I always like the lean plate, which is the two fists of fruits or vegetables, one fist of carbs, one palm of protein. When we're talking about a maintain plate, it is still that palm of protein. The palm of protein will be consistent throughout. We will have one and a half fist of carbs and then one and a half fist of fruits and, and or vegetables. And then finally, the game plate is two fist of carbs, one fist of veggies, one palm of protein. So, Eric, what plate did your lunch land at if we think about it? I would say it's on the maintain with minus. Well, I did eat a, a celery stock. Um, with my son. <laughs> there you go. Hey, there you go. Get a little bit of veggies in. <laughs> I ate a stalk of celery with my son. He's in there. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, let's eat the celery. <laughs> <laughs> let's get but, after it. So we have this peanut butter that you kind of have to stir. Ooh, so I yeah. used my celery stock to stir up the peanut butter to get the oil in there. And then I let him dip his in there and I just ate mine covered in raw peanut butter. So <laughs> that's because you're a good dad. Look at you not having to clean a knife. That's the that's way to right. do it. <laughs> <laughs> work smarter, not harder. You know what That's I'm saying? It. That's right. So yeah, so it's one of those things that anyone can really do. And, I, and as you mentioned, it has to be your hand. It can't be your kid's hand, can't be your yep. wife's hand, can't be your grandfather's hand or your grandmother. Mm. It is your hand. 
And that's how we personalize it, right? That's step yep. one. And if we look at how many meals we have, we have about 21 meals a week. That's breakfast, lunch, and dinner is not included in any snacks. So if you hit 17 of those to hit whatever plate you're looking for, then you're going to have the body you're looking for because you're hitting that 80-20 rule. So that means 17 of those meals need to hit a lean plate, maintain plate, or gain plate, and the other four can be whatever you want if that is your goal. And when I say gain, it's about gaining muscle. And yes, you will probably gain some body fat as well, but Mm -hmm. it's just really depending on what people's goals are, right? So if you can hit 17 of those a week, whatever your goals are, that's how you can make it work for you. And that's how you can find out if it's sustainable for you. If it's starting to become a hassle, then maybe that's not the right plan or maybe your behaviors aren't matching your goals. So truth or false, if I build Uh 17, (laughs) if I build 17 plates in a row, like starting on Monday, you know, and that's three, six, nine, 12, 15, 16, 17. So yeah, so let's say Saturday at lunch, I start eating whatever the heck I want to eat. And so Saturday at lunch and dinner, and then all day Sunday, I'm eating whatever I want. But Monday through Saturday breakfast, I'm eating my maintain, or I'm eating my lose, or I'm eating my gain. I'm going to see results. Is that truth or false? So if you're following, let's say, depending on what your goals are, let's use both. So one will do lean. If you're trying to lean out and you eat all those meals as a lean plate, then those other meals you eat as a maintain plate, yes, that is correct. Okay. Now, if you do go into a gain where a lot of people, a lot of people I've worked with, typically this is where they fall down that slippery slope. Well, they'll go out to dinner, they'll have a cocktail, a glass of wine or a beer, then they'll slip into another cocktail, wine, glass of beer. And what happens is that our body has this false sense of hunger. And we look yeah. for the thing with the biggest energy, which is typically pizza, Taco Bell, burgers, whatever's open at that night, because that's yes. literally it. And for every hour we lose of sleep, our body craves 300 to 500 more calories because it wants more energy to stay awake. And when we drink alcohol, it tells our body. So this is the analogy I like to use. Eric, if you had a fire and a leaky faucet in your house, which one would you attend first? The leaky faucet or the fire? I I guess it depends on how big the fire is. I mean, really big. If I fix the faucet, could I put out the fire? Probably not. You can only do one. Yeah, you're going to have to put out the fire. You're going to have to put out the fire. And yeah. your body sees alcohol as a fire and losing fat or trying to gain muscle as a leaky faucet, like literally just a drip. Yeah. So your body's not going to focus on that leaky faucet. It's going to focus on that fire. So getting rid of the alcohol. And I say that, Eric, I drink alcohol. I'm not here saying I don't. So what happens is our body's going to stop fat burning and it's going to start getting rid of the alcohol and store any kind of energy we have as stored energy. And stored energy is also known as adipose tissue or fat. Yeah. So I'm not saying you can't drink. I'm just saying typically when we drink, we get less sleep. We tend to crave more higher energy foods, less nutrient dense. So that's why typically after a night of drinking, we want high fat foods. We want high salt foods and we want high sugar foods because yeah. that's just our body knowing we need extra energy for those two to three hours. We might've lost to sleep and it's going to come back on the next day. So to answer your question, yes, you can, if you hit 17 of the other 21, but how are you really filling in those 21? Yeah. Are you adding those calories back in, or are you pacing yourself? And what I prefer to do, so the client, another client I was thinking about talking about this, he was someone who was told he couldn't have pizza or pasta. And we actually included it in his plan. So we would have pizza on Wednesdays and pastas on Saturdays. Why? Because we like to break it up. We don't need it all to be on that Saturday, Sunday, as as we had just proverbially mentioned. So we break it up so that it does give a little bit of a break. So that's not all at once. Because yeah. we think about the weekend, it's like, oh, we can eat all these foods. It's like, well, why can't you eat it throughout the week? Why can't we enjoy a nice pizza dish on a Wednesday? I, I'm a big Pizza Friday fan myself, but uh, <laughs> it's whatever fits into your lifestyle. So, Eric, yeah. yes, it will, it, but it goes to, back to it depends. Like, how far off the boat are you going on? And then when Monday comes around, are you feeling that regret? Are you feeling that guilt that so many people do? And they say, I'm going to get back on the, the horse. But what I like to say is, why did you get off of it? What caused that to happen? Why aren't we making these healthful decisions? Because if that's the way you're thinking about it, then this is not sustainable for you because you should be able to think about how this really fits into your day-to-day lifestyle. Not how do I hit 17 and then go all out on the other four. It's just those other four are here. That's good. If I feel like one night I want to go out and for example, football's coming out. I have a fantasy football league with some of my college buddies. I'm probably going to go have a couple drinks with them, but I'm not worried about it because that's one night or that's one day. I'm not letting it keep creeping in on the other days. Yeah. Right. So how do we make those choices so that it can fit our lifestyle, not us adapting to something that's not even close to what we're trying to do for our lives? 
Yeah, that really aligns with a lot of things I do in my teaching is talk about making sure your daily decisions align with where you want to be in life. And a lot of that has to do with identity and how do you identify? And one of the things that I say daily affirmations and in my daily affirmations, I do one that is all about identity. And usually I have to affirm myself that I am identifying as a person that does X, Y, Z. One of the biggest things that I wanted to shift my identity on is how much I eat when I go to my monthly meetup at the IHOP. And that kind of like, it's like this weird roller coaster of, well, it's going to bleed into what do I eat out when I go eating out all the time? And I wanted to tell myself, you are the kind of person that chooses a salad over a hamburger. Now you can have hamburgers, whatever, you know, but when you eat a hamburger, you're not doing it at the restaurant. You're going to make gourmet hamburgers and you're going to grill them on the grill at home. Yeah. And you're going to cook them with, with your son's help. And you're going to help patty up those burgers together. That's an experiential thing. But when you go out to a restaurant, you're more focused on the relationship with others than you are gorging your body with unhealthy foods. So I needed to pre- create this identity. I am not the person that orders the fattiest, biggest, nastiest thing on the menu. I am a person that identifies as someone that eats light at a restaurant and I'm more focused on giving other people my energy and speaking and talking with others than I am on putting as much food in my mouth as I can. And what you're talking about really just hits home that identity shift of, are you a person that identifies as, you know, eating this type of food? It really aligns with how I teach my students of, do you identify as a successful real estate investor? You know, When someone asks you, what do you do for a living? What is the first thing that comes out of your mouth? If it's not, I buy houses, then you you have an identity crisis. If you are a person that you want to be a person that buys houses and you want to buy every house you can get your hands on, then by God, your answer should always be, what do you do for a living? I buy houses. Do you know any houses that are for sale? You know, Do you know anybody that needs help solving a real estate problem so I can get in there and help them solve that problem? Mm -hmm. That's what your answer needs to be. And if someone asks you, hey, how do you identify as your food? Like, what what kind of food do you eat? You know, if you say, oh, I like burgers and fries and pizza and all those, you know, that's that's your identity and that's what you like. Now, I'm not saying you can't like those things. You can like those things. But I want to be able to tell people and answer this question of, what do you eat, Eric? Like, what? how would you describe your nutritional life? I would like to say I fuel my body with things that bring me sustainable energy and will help me live to be very old. Yeah. That's what I want to say. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I love that, Eric. That's what we should all want to say. That's right. And, you know, by God, we're going to keep work, waking up every day and telling ourselves those <laughs> affirmations in our in our amazing florally great coastal Hawaiian shirts. Yeah. We're going <laughs> to keep doing that every day. I love it. Tony, I, I know I uh, talked a little bit at the beginning about I'm going to shoot five questions at you. And I was hoping that you, you had those ready. Are you ready for our fast five? <laughs> Ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all. Uh, before before we get into this Fast Five, just want to just make a note. Uh, Tony has been an incredible guest with us today. His team did a great job of getting me information about him and his team and what they do. Tony is going to tell a little bit about how to get in touch with him on this journey. But if you're watching on YouTube, there is his Instagram link right below his amazing Hawaiian t-shirt below the the lobsters. Before we get into this fast five, tell people a little bit about your coaching program. What does it do and anything else that you might have to offer for our listeners? Absolutely. Honestly, what we do is we do at least it's a six month coaching program where the first three months we're working one-on-one calls every week because we want to make sure you're getting what you're doing. And I say six months because we want you to graduate. We want you to leave because if not, We are not doing what we promised, which is about building habits. We want you to be able to do it on your own. Probably not a great business model, Eric, but (laughs) we are happy with the people we work with because we want them to do it on their own. We want them Mm -hmm. to go through the struggles while they're working with us. And the reason, again, we do six months because we want them to do it on their own. But not only that, Eric, stressful times come and go. And we want to be there when you have a stressful time to see how you react from a nutrition standpoint, Mm -hmm. because that's what you're probably going to go back to. And how do we get you back to what you were doing? And it does happen right? So it is a three month one-on-one contract. And then it goes typically to six months. And then from there, we typically send a scale as mentioned before, so we can measure your body fat and muscle mass. We do send an HRV or heart rate monitor because we want to make sure that you're getting enough sleep, that you're managing your stress. 
We do do macros for those that need it, but it's mostly based on plate building. You get a community, you get 24 seven access to us as dietitians. Cause I have other people on my team that help as well. You get weekly zoom calls. So we get to see you, you see us. We do yeah. daily check-ins and make sure you're doing what you're doing because we're holding you accountable until you're ready to do it on your own. And yeah. they can learn way more about that. If they go to nutritionfp.com backslash on purpose, underscore investor again, nutritionfp.com backslash on purpose, underscore investor. And FP stands for performance. And there they can actually do three things, Eric. The first thing they can do is they can actually get a 10 question assessment to see how their health actually is. The mm-hmm. second thing they can do is they get a 30 day habit tracker that I work on with my clients. They get a video of me explain how they can change their one of their habits in 30 days. And mm-hmm. then finally, if they do feel like this is the right fit, they want to learn more about the program, they can go ahead and schedule a call with me. And that's nutritionfp.com backslash on purpose investor and on purpose underscore investor, I should state. And Eric, honestly, just a reminder, I've been there. I went through it. I mentioned in my story and you and I spoke about it. Like I was that overweight kid. I never got really until I understood the why behind it. And that's one of the things we teach in our programs. And I forgot to mention, we teach the why behind it. We have all the science, but you don't have to sit and study it. We literally give videos that I created. They take anywhere between five to 20 minutes where you can learn about different types of carbohydrates, why we should be eating protein every three to four hours. How much water should we be drinking in a day? How's this going to affect my energy? So many questions that we have when we work with people yeah. answer, right? And you get the daily accountability, but that's my coaching program in a nutshell. And it's really to help establish that mission, which is have people do these healthy lifestyle modifications so they can live a long, healthy life. And most of us aren't working out or eating to be in a nursing home where mm-hmm. we want to be around for a long time and be our best selves. Right. So thanks for asking that, Eric. And now we're ready for the fast five, I guess. Absolutely. <laughs> and all the links that, that he's talking about today, um, we are going to have them in our show notes and on the notes on our in, any platform that you're listening to this on. Uh, don't feel like you got to stop taking note on his link that he just mentioned. It will be in the show notes. So get to where you're going safely and then click on Please. that button. All right. Here's our fast five. Psh, psh. Number one, what advice would you give to those that are trying to live a more nutritionally balanced and and purposeful life? Hydrate or dehydrate. Very simple. So, so many of us are chronically underhydrated. 60% of our body is water. And one thing we don't do is drink enough water because that, remember at the beginning of this, I said, how can we improve our performance? If we're to two to 3% dehydrated, it actually decreases our performance by anywhere between seven to 10%. So if you're going into making any sort of investment deal, make Mm -hmm. sure you've had enough water that day. So that should be about half your body weight in ounces, not including any sort of physical activity you do. So if you're someone who weighs 200 pounds, you should be having at least 100 ounces of water a day. And that is a very simple way for you to make sure that you're drinking enough water. The other thing you can do is look at what your pee looks like. And I know this is not a great topic, but when I was was lucky enough to talk to a, a group of fifth graders and a friend of mine asked me, oh, would you wanna talk about what you do? I was like, how can I keep them intrigued? So for those of you on YouTube, and those yes. of you driving, you can watch Visual later. Visual aid. Yes. You can see my jars of pee I have on my desk. Uh, they're not actually pee. Uh, let me state that. But I had a bunch that of one, That things. one right there is going to die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we have the clear pee. We have the, the lemonade. And then we have the Diet Coke. One of them was apple juice, but Eric it fell. So I need to replace it. Uh, let that me one, tell you, it was not a fun mess. <laughs> that one looks like it has rhabdo. That one yeah. on the far end. <laughs> <laughs> you are absolutely right. We don't want this one. But. We could talk about that, but hydrate or dehydrate. Really, if people want to, those listening, make better health decisions and improve mm-hmm. their decision making by 10%, literally it is hydrate or dehydrate. So drinking half your body weight in ounces of water every single day. That is amazing. And I'm thinking like, I, you know, I weigh like a buck 80 and I'm thinking like half of that is 90. I need to drink 90 ounces. That's almost a gallon and a half of water a day. And a gallon is so, 128. Oh, gallons 128. So, yes. oh, I thought it was 64. Never mind. So, just making sure I don't want people having, yeah, <laughs> don't drink a whole gallon and a half because then you're going to be upset at me. <laughs> so, this this bottle has 750 milliliters. How many ounces is that? Do you 750 know? ml, 30, give or take 30, 30 ounces or so. Yeah. Yeah. So, I drink almost about six or seven of these a day. And actually on one of them, it says hydrate or die, I, but it's, yeah. in, it's in the washer right now. So it's in the sink. So <laughs> I didn't bring that one. I should have brought that one though. Hydrate yeah. or die. <laughs> All right. No, question number two, do you have any uh, YouTube or podcast shows that you would recommend to our listeners? It could be your I, own. I have to say it on purpose investor. If you aren't, please go leave a comment, like five-star review. These guys are awesome. Subscribe, do all that stuff. But the other one I like is one called Justin Sua. 
and he is an athletic performance. He does mental performance. They are literally five minute or less episodes. I like to listen to it every morning because it just gets me in that right mentality of things I should be thinking about as a high performing individual myself. Amen. That's the affirmations coming in and it's just coming in in a subconscious way. I love that. That's amazing. Number three, if you had to pick one book that you feel like has made the biggest impact on your life to date, what book would that be? It would be Darren Hardy, The Compound Effect. Mm -hmm. I think it's just small things really do add up and we keep trying to go for this magic or silver bullet. It's upstairs. (laughs) I do have that book upstairs. (laughs) But it's one of those things, right? Like we keep trying to do the things. We hear about these green powders. We hear about these fad diets and we keep Mm -hmm. trying to jump on it versus like what are the small incremental changes we can make that will pay dividends years from now. And Mm -hmm. it's tough, especially now in a society where we live in such instant gratification that it's tough to take time, understand where we're at and make the right choices. Yeah. In our earlier episodes, I was on this really big soapbox of delayed gratification. (laughs) And I even came up with this line of uh, teddy bears I was going to start selling called the delayed gratification care bear, where (laughs) when you feel like you need something right now, just go grab your delayed gratification care bear and give it a hug and say it can wait. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. You should sell that. That'd be great. I, I, maybe I, one day I will, I'll go to build a bear and yeah. I'll build a hundred of them and then sell them off. All right. So number four, what do you feel like has been the secret sauce to your success? Hydrate or dehydrate. <laughs> Honestly, just so many of us just need to hydrate. And I think just personally, I was someone that wasn't hydrating and then delayed gratification. Those two things, I think just learning that being in the ups and downs of not only my own personal journey, but in the business journey that I've had, it's just mm-hmm we keep looking for the magic bullet and it's really about what can you be consistent with? If you can't be consistent with it, you're really wasting your time. Yeah. Amen to that. All right. And our last question before we go today, Tony is how can our listeners get in touch with you? What's the, what's your preferred method and where can they follow you? Absolutely. So just go right to nutritionfp.com backslash on purpose underscore investor as mentioned earlier. And you can do those three things. Go ahead and reach out there. I have all my contact information there and be sure to sign up and get weekly newsletters. But Really, those three things I mentioned earlier, just go for it. And just a reminder, I was there. I've been through it. I've struggled. And I just want to help. Yeah. Well, amen to that. Thank you so much, Tony, for your time today. It has been an absolute pleasure having you on the On Purpose Investor podcast, where we talk about the art of living life with hyper intentionality and clarity so that you can live to be as old as you want to be and be happy with the decisions you made. And to include eating all those dinner rolls at Texas. Yeah. (laughs) All right, y'all take care and thank you for listening. We are immensely grateful for you joining us today. If you haven't already done so, we invite you to subscribe to our show. We understand that many of you tune in regularly, but perhaps haven't had the chance to hit that subscribe button yet. Don't worry, it's effortless. It takes about three seconds to follow or subscribe on your platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're enjoying the show. Your support is invaluable to us and has played a crucial role in the tremendous growth of our podcast. We sincerely appreciate your assistance in any way, shape, or form. Together, we can launch this podcast to even greater heights.